Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. Waiting to get started again. We want to give people plenty of opportunity to join us for the start of the webinar, which is taking place right now. Let's get rolling. Let's start talking about major donor microsites sites and personalized digital for major donor engagement. So uh, I've been doing this for quite a while, actually. Uh, fundraising for more than a decade now and video work for more than 20 years now. Uh, and it, I guess it just makes sense then that our firm has been moving more and more in this direction. We launched as a strategic consultancy uh, in January 2017, so almost two and a half years ago now. We've been doing a lot of giving days, crowdfunding projects, uh, campaign communication plans, major donor engagement strategies, and we just keep moving more and more towards video. <clears throat> it's my background. I've got Emmy-winning YouTube experience. I've got online fundraising experience. Combining the two makes the most sense. We've made some wonderful new hires in that direction, and a lot of the work we're doing with our partners is moving in this direction. <clears throat> and one of the things that we've been able to do, one of the ways we've been able to take all that fundraising strategy and video work and combine it is in this major donor microsite experience. And to give you a sense of what of what this looks like, I want to take things back actually six years ago almost, five and a half years ago really, in fall of 2013. Uh, this is back when I worked for Ben Squilly Fluster and we worked with Children's Hospital. And one of their donors is who you see right here. You should see his Facebook page. His name is Mike Fernandez. He is a uh, very wealthy, high capacity healthcare executive who uh, gives a lot of money to the Children's Hospital, has a personal connection to the Children's Hospital, and also has a really strong online network. You can see him here about to shake hands with Magic Johnson. He's close friends with people like Martin Sheen and Andy Garcia and Shane Battier. So really well-connected individual, knows a lot of people, and not just a lot of people, but a lot of people who are like him have a lot of capacity, a lot of wealth, and a lot of willingness to give some of that wealth to support nonprofit organizations. So Mike, having an affinity for Miami Children's Hospital, wanted to do something beyond his philanthropic giving. Uh, he wanted to be able to give back to the hospital <clears throat> and take a walk through Europe, going down a path called the El Camino de Santiago. If uh, you've seen the movie The Way starring Martin Sheen, it is uh, the, the trek, the pilgrimage that Martin Sheen travels in that movie, uh, maybe because Mike Fernandez is close friends with Martin Sheen. He was inspired by the film and went out and did the same walk himself and thought that by taking that walk, by going through this arduous journey through the mountains, the Pyrenees Mountains between Sp Spain and France, he might be able to drum up some support for Miami Children's Hospital just to get some exposure, some excitement. Uh, he knew social media. He knew content. He knew how to take selfies when out on the road. And the Miami Children's team knew how to leverage that. And they work with Mike and create a campaign just for him, a 30-day effort where he'd be walking through these mountains, uh, taking photos, taking videos, taking selfies, sending them back to the hospital, packaging them, and then sharing them via social media and email with, uh, <clears throat> with, their, with uh, the Miami Children's Hospital supporters. So uh, Mike did that, went out there for 30 days, one major donor chronicling his experience online, sending things back to a central online location or hub and a raising a tremendous amount of money along the way. Mike raised $1.2 million just from his network alone. His friends, his family, his close connections, people who knew him saw his efforts, saw his campaign, and made enormous gifts. Most of them not online, because some of these are some pretty substantial gifts in the five and six figure range. Uh, but they made gifts because they saw what Mike was doing. They were inspired by his activity, by his philanthropy, by his willingness to go above and beyond to support the Children's Hospital. So this was, this microsite example, before we even were calling it a microsite, uh, was, a, was a success because we were able to empower a major gift donor to tell his story with the communications lift of the Children's Hospital and combine that to reach his network and to find new donors as well, unlock giving from major gift prospects and donors. Um, not only did it secure giving from his network, but it also secured a lot of small gift fundraising too. 1.4 million was raised overall, which means about $200,000 came in from people who didn't know Mike, but who were attracted to the campaign because it was an inspiring campaign, because there's a ton of content, because Mike's personality really kind of carried the day. Uh, this campaign worked really well because first and foremost, you had this major gift donor who was leading by example and was producing this really authentic content campaign with the help of the Children's Hospital and delivering it to an audience on a regular basis. Uh, it also worked because we had a single web destination that was the home of the Mike Fernandez Together for the Children campaign. 
It was a microsite led by this major donor's personality with content that highlighted the major donor's support and why he was supporting the children's hospital. It was a very compelling, very compelling campaign. Whether it was sent to his close connections, some of those major donors who made big gifts to support the effort, or whether it was someone who saw the campaign on the hospital's Facebook page and gave as a result of it. So we had the technology, we had the major gift donor, we had the content, and we had a great team. The Miami Children's Hospital uh, had a wonderful team at that time, probably still do, uh, but at that time they certainly did, and th they built a fantastic campaign. They knew how to seize this opportunity. They, they didn't want to let you know something like this pass them by, and they didn't. They did a wonderful job building a campaign around this. And today I'm hoping that you know over the course of this webinar, that's what we're able to do for you as well. The microsite idea is something that uh, is really starting to take off, and you know we're seeing here a uh, an example from Emory University, not a real one. Uh, obviously, we're not going to share confidential donor information if uh, that donor doesn't give us express consent to do so. Um, but this looks a lot like some of the microsites that Emory's building, and other schools like Emory are building, and they're realizing that these microsites can work extraordinarily well uh, for every step in the process along the way. Uh, whether we're talking about cultivation, whether we're talking about the solicitation itself for stewardship, and especially corporate partner engagement, microsites are a phenomenal way of um, <clears throat> of just keep uh, of being able to engage these donors in a more meaningful sense in in a way that they already are. They're online. You know, we we see we've seen the stats, we've seen the reels, the numbers, the case studies, the examples, and the fact is, you know, the more wealth a person has, the more active they are online. So stewarding them, engaging them in this way works extraordinarily well. To do this right, to get the major donor microsite done right, you need three things. You need a web platform that's easy to use, a CMS that's easy to customize, something where you can quickly drop in videos and text copy and infographics and images. Uh, something that doesn't require a great deal of effort every time you want to spin one of these up because hopefully this is something where you're talking to a half dozen or a dozen or more uh, major donors throughout the course of uh, throughout the course of the year and having a, a web platform that is easy to leverage easy to spin up uh, it makes that obviously much easier Contents, content more and more so is the key to everything we are discovering this in such a big way at Groundwork Digital um, people are very likely to give if they watch a video about giving to your nonprofit organization. Uh, so, you know, content is key. Video is not the only content you can produce, but it is very important. Uh, you also need a team that understands how to leverage this. We're talking about major gift officers, uh, directors of development, uh, chief executive officers, executive directors. Um, people who can really think about this at a, a strategic level and can think about using the microsite for, again, every step of the process, cultivation, solicitation, stewardship, and how building these sites with great content that features the donors can make a, a good deal of difference and can help really move the ball. So let's, let's take each one of these things uh, in pieces, in their individual parts, and look at how to do it. First, I want to talk about the platform. Um, you can't really have a microsite without a platform on which you can build a microsite. So there are there are a number of different options out there at different price points, and they do different things based on what you're hoping to accomplish. First and foremost, though, you have to be able to easily adjust. You have to be able to create video, to do text updates, to produce these to produce these without having a computer coding degree. So easy to use CMS is important. Rich backend data is also important. Uh, this is you know, let's say that you have a microsite and you're able to track effectively, you know, who who that major donor is sharing the microsite with and who's taking action on it and being able to uncover new prospects through their behavior and activity through a microsite. So there's a lot of value to that, of course. There's a lot of different ways of doing this too. Uh, you know, from Google Analytics to some custom platforms that are out there, um, you can get a, a good deal of information that can really help inform your strategy going forward and make the most out of the microsite experience. The one thing I, I would cost you to think about though is, you know, don't break the bank on a platform right away. Uh, if you have a lot of resources, then by all means, look at what's out there. Again, there are some wonderful tools. Think about using those tools so that you can get, for example, that rich backend data. But, you know, if if your primary purpose, and I think for most of us this would be, if your primary purpose is simply building a good experience uh, for your 
for your major donors where you want to have custom video that addresses them by name that talks about the impact of their specific gifts there are a lot of low-cost options that exist from wix to wordpress to squarespace or even just taking a page on your existing website whatever your website is built on and taking a template and building a major donor microsite and maybe protecting it with a password for example uh, that works really well that serves the primary purpose of microsites which is individual engagement cultivation and stewardship of one particular donor or prospect. Um, again, there's a lot of really nice features that some of the more high-end tools provide, but the reality is there are higher priorities you need to check off before you get that really nice platform. Again, if you can go for, if you can go all in, go all in. Um, but if not, start with content because content really is everything. Uh, it, it's the key to engaging, acquiring, and retaining donors. Look at this stat from the Abdila Donor Loyalty Study. 72% of donors say they stopped donating because of poor, vague, or irrelevant content. Three quarters of the people you lose are saying that they're leaving you because you're not telling them a good enough story. You're not giving them enough information about how their gift is making the world a better, different, improved place. So content's critical. It's also difficult, I understand. It's hard to keep a steady flow of content moving, especially if that's not, if that's not your area of expertise, but it's so critically important. Uh, to be able to really rise above the noise. We get so many emails and so many solicitations from the politicians we follow to the schools we attended to the nonprofits we support. Um, to be able to rise above that requires a fantastic content game. And I think that's what this stat is basically telling us is they're just not, you know, they're just not getting anything above through the run of the mill emails. That follows them to look at video. Video being the supreme type of content. Because according to a Google study, 57% of everybody who watches a nonprofit's video will eventually go on to make a gift to that nonprofit. If you haven't seen this stat before or something like it, just let that soak in for a second. 57% of everyone who watches a nonprofit's video will go on to make a gift to that nonprofit. That's incredible. Now, I get it. Google owns YouTube, so, you know they have an interest in uh, showing a stat like this. But if it's even 10% accurate, I mean, how many times do we post a video to, you, to, to Facebook and maybe get four or 500 or even better, four or 5,000 likes? And think about how many of those people are eventually going to become donors if they sit through that entire video and watch it. Um, it, it is powerful. And we're seeing this with our partners too. The, the partners that we do the most video with, that put a ton of video out on giving days, that support crowdfunding with giving, uh, that with video that have multi-channel appeals that have a strong video element those tend to do better uh, and it's it's pretty clear cut there are a few exceptions for that so you need a lot of video you need to either hire video internally or you need to look outside for a firm to do video or which is often the case for the partners that we work with it's both it's it's having some internal team that can do some video work that can do video strategic planning but also having an outside vendor to fill in the gaps one of the things that we've done with our partners or are doing actually just starting to do now is uh, a concept in higher education we'll call it the student content team but the one thing i want to make clear if you're listening to this and you're not in higher ed this could be done with a volunteer content team or a staff content team uh, the whole goal is finding a group of people who are really good at being in front of the camera they're hosts they have the personality that's dynamic engaging and can keep people involved in a video uh, and we see them a lot so that our audience gets to know them. So they have the ability to produce and especially star on video and they know how to do social media as well. It's kind of that one two punch of just being a modern communicator. The skill set of being a, a capable video producer and a capable video uh, talent or star and also someone who can do social media. That, that combination is extremely valuable. And what we're doing then with our partners is we're nurturing this with the student content team concept. We've seen stuff like this. We see it all the time. If you're a sports fan, um, you know, this is from the, my alma mater, the University of Minnesota, but I'm sure a lot of other schools have students like this who are sideline reporters. And again, uh, very charismatic, um, you know, sharp personalities that are very good in front of a camera, even in live settings, which is important because of things like Facebook and Instagram live. Um, you know, they're, they're personalities that stick with people and people remember them, especially when you show them this personality over time. And that's what we do with the student content team or the volunteer content team is we're developing these personalities who are always talking about philanthropy. Sometimes they're asking for a gift, but more often than not, they're just explaining what the mission is. What are we doing? 
How are we driving home our message? How does our how do our donors know on a weekly basis that the gifts they're giving are making the world a better place? We're delivering that message through the student content team. Um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of benefits to this. One, it creates this relationship with donors and with alumni and with supporters. And when you have these these students with whom our supporters have sort of this digital relationship with. The email open rate numbers, and I'll show you a stat in just a bit that really drives this home, but the email open rate numbers skyrocket, even the conversion rates, the number of gifts you're able to generate from an email that is sent by a name that a person recognizes versus the same email that comes from an organization, it's dramatic. And again, I'll show you just how dramatic in a second. But again, with the student content team or volunteer content team, we're nurturing those relationships. Keeping the mission front and center, for higher education, it's students, but for all of us, if we're talking about our, if we're talking about our mission, if we're talking about the impacts of gifts on a regular basis, it's working, and you know, it, it's kind of like you know the call center of uh, of today, and we've had the old school call center for quite some time. Um, part of what, part of what, the reason why call centers still work, even though there's a lot of obstacles in front of calling programs. Donors and alumni, they like being able to talk to a student and say, hey, what's campus look like today? What's going on in the organization? What's new? You know, what, you know, what am I not seeing by looking just at your website on a daily basis? That's what a content team can deliver. And it, the reason why I talk so much about this now is because, again, we need a lot more content. The obvious, the obvious byproduct of having a content team is you've got a lot more content. And that's what helps keep people engaged and exactly the type of thing that we can then populate some of these major donor microsites or corporate microsites with. Meaningful, mission-centric content featuring the people who are being served or perhaps your staff who can then show the, uh, the impact of the mission. Video is not everything. Again, we can do things beyond video and infographics is one of my favorite ways of showing anything that has to do with numbers. So if we're talking about annual reports, and in some cases, some of the partners we're talking with are considering personalized annual reports, Go infographic, that works really well. Um, campaign updates, impact of giving, you know, these microsites, they can be dynamic. If you have an easy to use CMS, an easy to use platform that you can update on a regular basis, uh, you know, keep it updated on a regular basis. Keep people apprised of what's happening with the campaign or a new big gift that came in or something that, uh, you know, something really, really cool that happened that impacts your mission and makes it easier to accomplish. So the content is a big part of it. But so is having a team that can leverage this for engaging donors. And that's where the training comes in. We want to be able to build a plan that includes our fundraisers, that benefits our fundraisers using digital. We've seen this. Uh, we've done a lot of these now uh, with a number of different partners. And it starts with sort of a group workshop, training workshop program to get everybody up to speed and rowing in the same direction towards using digital to engage some of our most capable donors who are also active in the digital space. Uh, then we go into these digitally enhanced solicitation strategies where we're now breaking it down to one-on-one -on -one or small group meetings with gift officers or corporate and foundation relation officers. And we're talking about how digital can enhance their solicitation strategies and can get to, you know, can, can shorten the runway towards a gift, can increase fundraising from a current donor, can, you know, make possible a gift from someone who's gone cold on us. Uh, all of that has happened, and all that does happen with this approach of using one-on-one -on -one coaching and strategizing. So we have the training workshops, the digitally enhanced solicitation strategies. That usually involves prospect research to begin with, and then we bring in the development officers and then brainstorm and come up with ideas. And then we build these action plans for the development officers, which includes, again, the solicitation strategy. You know, here are the top six donors or prospects that we've discovered who are active online. And here are the tactics we can use to engage them. So that's a big part of it, giving the development officers a playbook, a plan to go and engage these prospects in a new way that leads to more fundraising. Uh, we also want to help development officers become more active in the digital space. Uh, there are so many, and this has been true for quite a while, uh, going back four or five years. So many development officers who most frequently talk with their prospects in the comment sections on Instagram. The campaign chairwoman of the University of Minnesota's $4 billion campaign, how do we most frequently see her, hear from her? In the comment sections on Facebook posts sent out by development officers that she knows. Uh, major donors and prospects are very active in this space, so our development officers also need to be active in this space. And that's a big part of what this DO program uh, aims to do. And then, of course, the microsites. Uh, the microsites are a, a very important engagement tactic for someone who is digitally active. The cultivation side of it, that alone, 
you know, just warming up someone, giving them an experience that they're not expecting, moving them towards a gift by showing them the impact of what that gift will do before they make that gift. Uh, it, we're seeing it work in a really big way. This is an actual quote that just came to us last week, and it's not the first one like it that we've seen. This is from an actual prospect, actual donor to an organization that we work with, and, you know, looking at her microsite, looking at her personal content, she was thrilled, deeply grateful, she said, because it is an honor. It's an honor to see that the organization that you care about and supporting is willing to put so many resources behind your support to, to engage you, to thank you, to steward you. And then the best part, and this happens a lot, she can't wait for her sister to see it. She can't wait to share that microsite. It happens all the time whether in a corporate setting or an individual donor setting, when you build these microsites, they're so easily shareable, whether they're posting them to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or dropping the link in an email or putting it in a text message and sending it out. Most of these donors and prospects, and one of the main reasons why we do this is so that they will unlock their network. Remember Mike Fernandez at the beginning uh, when we couldn't quite see it yet because I wasn't sharing my screen, but he raised more than $1.2 million from his network because he was an enthusiastic ambassador sharing that content because he was the star of the show that's a big part of the reason why we do this a to move the donor or the prospect towards making a gift or perhaps thanking them for making a gift but also engaging their networks giving them something that they're excited to share the solicitation piece uh you know doesn't matter whether it's a giving day or giving tuesday or uh, a crowdfunding campaign or a personalized fundraising campaign you can build these into solicitation engines that, number one, again, secure a gift usually beforehand from a major gift donor who's featured in the campaign, but then also solicit their networks. And again, we'll see a few more examples from that in just a bit. And then one of the more obvious pieces, I think, is the stewardship. You've already got the gift. You know the story. You know what the gift's supporting, and you want that donor to feel great. And if you're doing the microsites, this is one wonderful application of microsites is for stewardship. So again, digitally enhanced solicitation strategies, it starts with identifying the donors and the prospects who are active in the digital space and who might be interested in a microsite, and then brainstorming engagement strategies using digital, and then what, is it, what does it amount to? Is it for cultivation or stewardship, or is it a match or a challenge that they might give for a giving day or, or a, a regional or a regional giving day or a giving Tuesday, or is it a personal crowdfunding campaign, or perhaps simply having them be the star of their own video show? There's a lot of options. When it comes to finding those Digitally active individuals, there's a lot of tools out there uh, that can help you with this. One that you know we've been, been fortunate enough to use with some partners uh, and really just recently had quite a bit of success with it is Evertrue. I'm sure you've heard of them. Um, if not, basically what they do is they, they help you discover who's following you on Facebook, but more importantly, who's engaging with you on Facebook and LinkedIn, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. So what we discovered with one particular partner this past winter is that they had literally dozens of major gift prospects who had liked Facebook posts from the institution more than 1,000 times over the years. That's how deeply engaged they were with these different pages across campus, sometimes dozens of pages. Now, but this gives you so much great information. Uh, it tells you affinity points, what they're most interested in. What are they saying? What are they commenting on? Is it is it in an area that you didn't originally guess they would be interested in? Is it right where you thought they'd be interested? And this only reaffirms it. Did their interest just sh suddenly spike in the past six months? And we weren't even talking to them, but we should be <laughs> because they're close to making a gift. Uh, using this tool, we've, we've heard of you know, seven-figure gifts drop literally out of the blue simply because they found that somebody was frequently posting on a particular Facebook page within an organization. And if we have someone who's doing that, if we have someone who's very active in the digital space and they're very active on Facebook and they're liking a lot of what you're putting out there, that's a great candidate, of course, for a microsite. So one of the things that I'm seeing, again, getting back to how do we build a team around this, is in a few cases, like you have here from Kansas State, uh, the hiring of digital development officers. And this is so awesome to see because there's so much potential here. We have so many people who are major donor capacity individuals or corporate people who are active online, active in the major gift sense, and active on social media. Having a digital development officer makes a ton of sense. Um, so it's really, really, really good to see this. Um, I'm excited to see this. I'm excited to see where this goes. You know, it's a, it's a great or, it's a great shop over there at Kansas, Kansas State. And, uh, you know, this is this I think is the future. You know, having someone who can really lead those digital solicitation strategies can help craft microsites, can help bring other development officers up to speed and using technology. Not exactly sure how they're doing it with these two individuals at Kansas State, but I'm really excited to watch what they do and, and how they grow this program. 
So we've got the platform, we've talked about having content, and we've talked about building a team. Uh, now here's why this works so well. Online ambassadors is something that we've been doing, that I've been doing, you know, again, back since my Ben Swirly Flessner days, you know, many, many years ago, up through my Ruffalo Noel Levitt scale funder days, and now with Groundwork Digital. And it's grown up quite a bit, especially in the past year or two. You know, it used to be with online ambassadors, you would send, you'd have a mass of, I don't know, five 5,000 ambassadors or 500 ambassadors, and you would email them when it was a giving day or when it was a, a regional giving day or giving Tuesday or something, and you just said, hey, can you share this for us? That's still a good idea. I'm not saying we should necessarily stop doing that, but we need to take more of a pro portfolio-based approach to managing online ambassadors, and it makes sense there's a lot of overlap with major gift donors in this sense. We need to be more deliberate, we need to be more hands-on, and saying for quite some time this needs to be a real volunteer program with a volunteer manager. You've got to put some resources towards online ambassadors to make them work because the reality is every online ambassador who used to share everything you sent them five years ago now gets about 50 of the same emails from other institutions, other nonprofits, REI, Coca-Cola, Abercrombie and Fit, you know, people get it uh, we, and we've, we've saturated just like with everything else there's a lot of noise in the online ambassador space a lot of people are asking your ambassador to share if they're active online trust me they're getting it from more than one place which is too bad because online ambassadors work really 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 well this is that email conversion rate i was talking about earlier look at this number an email sent from an online ambassador has an average this is more than a thousand nonprofits blackbot looked at has an average of 25% conversion rate. For every four people an online ambassador sends an email to, you're going to get a gift. That is incredible, that's a good open rate. This is a conversion rate. Now let's take the exact same email and let's drop the online ambassador's name and instead put your organization's name. So, uh, you know, instead of, you know, tom at gmail.com, it's, uh, you know, give at savethewhales.com. Well, that give it save the whales.com versus the individual's email drops considerably. It goes from a 25% conversion rate to a 0.8% conversion rate, which is much more in line with industry average. Uh, so known sender emails, emails from online ambassadors are literally 312 times more effective at securing a gift than the exact same email with the org as a sender. This should have ripple effects throughout every level of our fundraising program. And it should impact your major gifts program as well. And here's why, especially in the major gift sense, we need to pay attention to this. So this is a word of mouth marketing association study back in 2014. And what it was looking at is the amount that influence plays into high consideration purchases. High consideration just pretty much means big ticket, sort of once or twice or three times in a lifetime type purchases. Buying, uh, buying a new car, a new home, which college you select, uh, things like that. You know, really high consideration purchase, and of course, a lower consideration purchase is like, you know, what shampoo do you buy, or you know, what's your favorite kind of pizza. Um, you know, yeah, sure. I mean, influence, peer influence might affect that too. But the reality is, the more high consideration the purchase, the more peer-to-peer -peer influence matters. But here's what's especially important: online peer-to-peer, -peer, online word of mouth has the highest impact on high consideration purchases. So if we look at this, you know, the the pizza or the shampoo. That's a lot more of an annual fund level gift, right? A lot more of an annual fund level activity. You're just, you don't put as much thought into a $25 or $50 gift as you do the biggest gift you're going to make in a lifetime. For some people, maybe that's $500 or $1,000. For other, maybe it's $5 million. Uh, so again, a big decision, a big financial decision is influenced more by online peer-to-peer -peer conversation than just about any other factor. So, you know, while we've thought about ambassadors in this annual fund sense for so long, it actually makes a lot more sense to think of them in the major gift sense. And let's look at this in the real world. We saw the Mike Fernandez example. Let's look at Sherry Funk with World Vision. Uh, so this is something we discovered, uh, again, back in my BWF days, uh, doing a, an assessment for World Vision. And we found this woman who went online on her own volition. Uh, this is entirely her decision. No one coached her to do this. But she went and she created this campaign for her 60th birthday using the crowdfunding platform they had available to anybody. And she set this crazy $60,000 goal. Now, I'm, I'm quite certain I couldn't do that. I'm going to go ahead and guess just about everybody on the line today probably couldn't raise $60,000 in a day if their life depended on it. But most of us are probably not major donor capacity individuals. Sherry is. Sherry is a major gift donor to World Vision, and she beat that goal. She raised more than $61,000 in 24 hours because Sherry 
being a major gift donor has a network of people who have the same capacity. Gifts of two thousand, a thousand, five thousand, three thousand dollars just came pouring in. Twelve first-time donors in that one twenty-four hour period gave gifts of a thousand dollars or more, making them instant leadership annual donors and new major gift prospects right away. Again, first-time donors to the organization. So of course, you know, after discovering this, we dug in a little bit more and it wasn't that much of a surprise to the peer-to-peer uh, -peer team at World Vision because they had this graphic pretty much ready to go. And they looked at their Team World Vision accounts. Team World Vision is like, you know, biking, running, cycling uh, events uh, around the world, I think at least around North America for sure. And they have about, uh, over the course of, I think, five years, about 32,500 people sign up for these Team World Vision crowdfunding pages. And of the 32,500 who signed up, about 6,000, so the top 18% were their major donor fundraisers, just people who in some way, shape, or form are categorized as having that type of capacity. Even though they only made up 18% of all of their fundraisers using Team World Vision, those major donor fundraisers brought in 80% of all of that revenue for Team World Vision program. And I, I don't know for sure, but it'd be really curious to see how much research was put into those individuals who gave as a result of those major donor fundraisers. The point is, online campaigns, when we put them in the hands of our most capable donors, lead to serious fundraising success. Again, same is true with Mike Fernandez. When major donors are the online ambassadors, they feed the prospect pipeline. We see this everywhere. We see it in higher education. We've seen it multiple times in healthcare. We've seen it in advocacy, humanitarian organizations. I, every vertical where we've worked as Groundwork Digital, has seen big time fundraising success when we put major donors, uh, microsites in the hands of major donors. And one of the wonderful side effects is not just the giving and not just the experience from those donors who are behind the microsites, but the new donors they introduce to the organization who have similar capacity. Big gifts come via their very capable networks. Microsites, again, facilitate this better than just about any other tactic because it makes it easy for them to communicate and share their message about why they support an organization with their very well-to-do friends. So what to watch for, what to look for. And again, uh, I just want to remind everybody about the questions. Uh, I know you know you're there because you all very um, <laughs> very kindly reminded me that we weren't sharing the screen for the first few slides. Um, but please, if you can now, go ahead and drop uh, some questions in. We'll get to them in just about five or 10 minutes here. The question section over on the control panel, I would love to hear what's on your mind. I'd love to know what you're thinking. Um, and uh, you know, get to those questions in just a bit. So please do type in those questions now at any point and we will get to them shortly. What to measure? New prospect ID should be one of the first things you think about when you have any kind of a solicitation-based fundraising campaign using these major donor microsites. Because again, just like we just discussed, the people who are going to give to these campaigns are individuals who are going to have a lot more capacity. Uh, just by and large, because they're in the same circle as a major donor who introduced into the campaign in the first place, you're going to have better luck finding major gift prospects within those group of donors who give to the microsites. Right, so make sure we're keeping track of who it is. Make sure that we're keeping notes. Um, you know, one of the things that I like to think about is how can we work with these, these major donor ambassadors who are willing to be at the center of a microsite to engage the prospects who give through their microsites? You know, we are seeing this where major donors themselves in an increasing way are becoming fundraisers because they are the ones who have the connection. That's not entirely new, of course. It's been happening uh, in many ways and shapes and forms over the years. But this is another way to kind of identify that and make it happen. Um, knowing what content works. You know, what type of video seems to be behind the, the most successful microsites? We want to make sure the microsites we're producing are effective and successful. So make sure we're tracking, you know, is it a, is it all video? Is it a mix of video and infographics? Are infographics the best? Are we wrong about video? You know, what works for our audience? We're keeping track of that. Working with your social media managers is also important because, you know, again, there, there's technology that can enable us to do a lot of things in this space, but budget is always going to be, you know, for a lot of us, a hindrance, especially for some of the smaller organizations. I understand that. So working with your social media manager, give them a list of your top or 20 most likely digitally active major donors and prospects. Make sure your social media manager knows them by name and by face so that when they post to Facebook, post to Instagram, post to Twitter, post to LinkedIn, make a comment on a YouTube video, you know, whatever it is, we want to make sure that we are recognizing that, that we're seeing that, that we're tracking that, and we're and we're we're taking note of it because again, if someone suddenly is very very active on you know our Instagram channel, that means they're thinking about us in a very big way. 
now is the time to have a conversation with that donor or that prospect. And then we got to see how well they work. I mean, and, and this, you know, this has been a lot of fun. I, 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 it's really some of my favorite engagements. I mean, I, I love doing, you know, giving days has kind of been our bread and butter for a long time. But I love being able to do these microsites because they almost always work so well. Whatever they're trying to accomplish, whether you're driving event attendance, you can certainly use it for that. It doesn't have to be a fundraising specific, uh, you know, microsite. You could be working with some of your campaign volunteers to drive event attendance. Uh, tracking meeting requests, you know, do, are, are meeting requests somehow going up for gift officers who are using microsites? And then, of course, what is it doing for fundraising? You know, who is making gifts? What about the donor who's featured in the microsite? Has their giving gone up? Have they made a big new gift as a result of it? Who is giving through their campaigns? Are they new prospects? Are they new donors? So much fun stuff, exciting stuff to track in that sense. So before we get to questions, just to recap, Rethink your major donor strategy to include microsites. If you're not doing this yet, you really should be. And the bar is fairly low. Again, there's some really good content, uh, really, really good platforms, amazing content that you can produce. You know, you can put a lot of resources behind this and have a tremendous amount of success, but you can also just pilot this with maybe one of your top online donors and build it off of a web page that you currently own. Uh, so, you know, one way or another, rethink your major donor strategy to include microsites because it works so darn well. Train your team. Make sure your digital development officers are up to speed and make sure they understand why this works, how it works, and, and who it can work for. I think that's the big thing, I think, is working with them to identify the prospects and donors um, for whom this can, this can be successful. Um, do invest in content. And this, again, can be done in a lot of different ways. Maybe you have a hire, someone who's coming up, a, a new employee, and you can rework that job description to find someone who can produce video. Maybe you have a volunteer who can donate some video uh, to work to you. We, we see that happen quite a bit with a lot of the smaller organizations that don't have the budget. But if you do have budget, this is one of the first places you should turn to because it's solid gold. The ROI and good content over time. You remember that retention stat, 72% of everybody who stops giving to you did it because you weren't giving them good content. So investing in content is very important. And then find a technology that makes the most sense. Um, you know, again, Content's the most important thing. Having a good team that can really leverage this is also very important. Um, but you know, being able to dig into your data, uh, you know, have this automated, and have a really good platform that you know is more than just a you know donor-facing microsite, but has a really awesome backend uh, that can that can do a lot for you as well. So if you have questions, a couple of ways of talking to me. Uh, we can ask them right now. Go ahead and type them in. And I'll wait, I see a couple that are already in there and I'll get to those in just a second. As we're answering these questions, if you have any more, let me know. Um, or at any point, I'm, at, uh, I'm Justin at groundworkdigital.com and I would love to continue this conversation with you after we jump off the webinar.